Y'all's armed up, raise it up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do absolutely everything that it says I can do. For I am a believer and I'm not a doubter. For faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Well, give the Lord a hand clap of praise one more time. Well, are you blessed and you know it? Well, today we're going to pick back up and hopefully we'll be finishing up on today. We had actually been talking the last couple weeks that we have been ministering here together. We had been talking about how to overcome discouragement. And of course, we preference did uh, actually probably probably been about six or seven weeks ago we've been talking about discouragement we we said that discouragement it visit every household and that no one exempt from experiencing discouragement from time to time and then we begin to delve into 10 ways how to overcome discouragement number one was pray we say that it's so important that we pray and invites the supernatural into our circumstances and then number two we said that you got to prepare yourself for the discouraging situations you're bound to encounter and number three, we, we said, remember who God is during these times. And number four, we said that you got to stick to your assignment. And number five was you got to get guidance from Christian counselors or mentors. And number six, we said that you got to refill your spiritual energy tank. And then number seven, we said that you got to take care of your physical health. Number eight, you got to spend time with someone who isn't discouraged. And number nine, we said that you got to give to people in need. And number 10 was we said you got to simplify your life. And number 11, we said you got to share your faith with others. And number 12, you got to use the talents God has given you. And then number 13, we said that you got to resist Satan's efforts to discourage you by using people. Remember, we talked about that. We say that if you can't grow with me, you can't go with me. We talked about that, how you have to disconnect from people that have insecurities, immaturity. We talked about how to recognize divine covenant relationships in your life. And then on last week, we talked about how there are certain people in your life. We talked about people, the drama queens, the victims, and the yeah buts, and you know, and and who else? We talked about the, uh, the people eater. I remember we talked about the people eater. And then we ended up on number 14. We talked about, but how do I cultivate perseverance? Because in order for me to, to bounce back from discouragement, I got to know how to cultivate perseverance in my life. And we said that pers perseverance was, actually was persistence, steadfastness, determination, is resolve, is firmness, is purposefulness, is staying power, is stubbornness, is inflexibility. And then we went on to say that these are the ways that we began to cultivate perseverance. Number one, we talked about that the word of God must be the final authority in my life, the final authority. Number two, we said that you have to visit your future on the canvas of your imagination. We said that you got to imagine, you got to meditate, you got to envision, you got to visualize, you got to create on the canvas of your imagination. We said that a painter has the, the opportunity to create on a brand new canvas. And we said that so do we as well. We have the opportunity to actually draw a brand new picture from our past. We said that we got to visit our future, not from past unfortunate experiences, but rather from God's perspective. And then number three, we said that you must eliminate satanic worrying and must be excited about God's plan for your life. We talked about worry that it paralyzes us, that worry is simply the misuse of God's creative imagination, which he has placed in your life. And then number four, we said that you must be engaged in spiritual work. We said that you got to be spiritual employed. How many remember that? We said that you got to get out of the unemployment line and you got to be employed in the kingdom of God. And then number five, we said that we have to embrace speaking the word of God. We talked about the fig tree. And then we began to talk about the mountains and we began to speak to mountains. Amen. And then number seven, six, we, it said, we talked about expect God to move supernaturally. We talked about people are losing confidence in the supernatural. 
And then number seven, we said, we must enjoy spiritual worship, for it is a catalyst that moves the hand of God. How many remember that? We talked about worship and what worship was. It is not just clapping hands or singing, but it's actually, it comes from the heart. And we said that people can teach you to pray, they can teach you to sing, but nobody can teach you to worship. It's something that just happens in the presence of God. It's nothing that you conquer up. It's something that you just happens. It's almost like love. You just can't make your Yourself fall in love with somebody either you in love with them or you're not and so that's how we said we said love is spontaneous and so is worship and so today we are going to end up on that number 14 and we are going to talk about an example of someone that was actually had perseverance and the woman that I want to talk about for the remaining of our time today is the woman with the issue of blood say the woman with the issue of blood this is a woman that had an issue of blood, a woman who had had a faith born in desperation. Turn over your Bibles over to Mark 5, 23, 23, Mark 5, 23, Mark 5, 23. This woman experienced a shift, a shift. And I have a different acronym for shift today, supernatural help in failing times. <laughs> supernatural help in failing times this woman had supernatural help in failing times she had a shift situation that took place it's over in mark 5 23 through 24 it says a large crowd followed and pressed around him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had yet instead of getting better she grew worse but when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. The Bible says immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowning around you, his disciple answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and knelt at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now the background of this passage actually talk, actually began when Jesus was crossing the Sea of Galilee. And there he had healed a demon-possessed man who had been uncontrollable. And then Jesus crossed the sea and returned back to Galilee. And there he was in the multitude, and he ran across Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. And Jairus begged Jesus to help his daughter who was about to die. Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house when this incident happened. And so here it is, this woman in the incident who had a long-standing medical problem. The Bible says for 12 years she had endured a slow hemorrhaging that would not stop and could not be stopped. Now that is actually 4,383 days. It is 144 months. It is 624 weeks. It is 105,000 and 192 hours. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a long time. 4,383 days, 624 weeks, 144 months, and 105, 1,092 hours, a long time. 12 years is a long time to be sick. Long time to be sick. But first notice, she was truly a unusual woman. She was a woman of persistence. She was unusual because she was determined to find a cure for her ailment. Though it had been 12 years, she had not stopped trying. And so Mark indicates that she went to many doctors and suffered a lot as a result of the treatment she received. He also says that she spent everything she had on those visits and treatments. However, nothing permanently stopped her hemorrhage. When treatment resulted in pain rather than relief, she did not, you know, couldn't call for no painkillers or, you know, go, you know, go find another doctor. She was kind of like cut, just cut there, stopped 
in a place of not being able to get past her element. There was no help in sight. There was no doctor that could cure her. The Bible says that she had went to every doctor that she knew of and still grew worse. Matter of fact, she had become completely, completely financially drained of her finances trying to get better. Have you ever been in a situation where, have you ever had an issue where you have just tried everything and seen like everything that you tried didn't work? You tried everything. You called everybody. You knew to call. You did everything. Everything that you know to do in the natural, but yet something just did not click. You tried everything. Somebody said, well, you know, go over there. They got your answer. Go over there. They'll help you. You know, go see this attorney. He got your answer. He'll help you. And so one by one, you're going to people and places and things trying to get help. Now, can you imagine this woman for 12 years had been hemorrhaging for 12 long years without any relief? This is constant, a constant flow of hemorrhaging. Can you imagine how tired she was? The women can relate. I mean, you go five days or seven days, and you just like, you know, you know, I, I need some help. I need some relief. This woman, 12 long years, she had to be desperate. Her persistence indicates she was an unusual person. She was unusual because she was open to hope after 12 years of failure. Have you ever been in a situation for 12 years and just kind of wonder, Lord, am I ever going to get out of this? After repeated failure and being broke, it would be easy to give up. She could have easily said, you know, I, I just ain't got no hope. I have no desire to get excited again, only to be discouraged. I done been to doctor to doctor and still there was no help. Seeing Jesus was not like making an appointment with a doctor. He continually moved from place to place. So it wasn't like you can just call him up and say, Dr. Jesus, I'm, I'm, I have an appointment with you. I need, I'll be at your place at, at, at 2 o'clock on today. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't no such thing as an appointment. You almost had to go just wherever he was. And then once you got there, you know, he may have moved to another place. And so here you is, you know, here she was, I'm sure, you know, kind of trying to find, well, where is he going to be today? And what time do you think that he's going to be here? He just left Galilee. Do you think that, you know, he's going to be here for, you know, give me enough time to, you know, get myself together, get out the house and make it to where he is? Do you think that I have the opportunity to get there? And so here she was, desperate. Look at your neighbor and say, she must have been extremely desperate. She was unusual because she was bold, not assuming. She was confident that if she just touched him, she would be okay. She planned to touch Jesus was a decision of real courage. Because you have to realize she lived in a man's world. Woman was not able to really go out publicly, especially when they was hemorrhaging. Women could not even speak to men who were not their husbands in public. And here she was going out public hemorrhaging. She was determined. Have you ever tried to work your way through a massing, pressing, pushing people who had the same goal you had to get near the same person? It's almost like, have you ever went shopping? Maybe like the day after Thanksgiving? <laughs> What they call that Black Friday. So me and Pastor, we decided we're going to try it this time. Well, we had never done it. And so we went out into the mall, and then we was really bold. We got up like at 6 o'clock. So we was really, really, really daring. So we went out to find some deals. And, of course, we found a few deals, good deals, real good deals. But as we went from store to store, we was pressing against people. People was everywhere. I mean, it, it was almost like you wanted to say, you know what, forget it. I, I, let's, let's just go back. This is too many people. I mean, I know that some of y'all like being in a crowd and, you know, you, you like all the excitement of shopping from place to place and all that. But we, 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 really, don't, we really don't do a whole lot of shopping. We go we get what we want and come on back. But this time, they say it was a good sale. So we said, well, we're going to go on out there and check it out. But there was folks everywhere. 
and we was running into people. And then, and, and then I got so tired of waiting on him, I, I just laid out. I said, just follow me. And so I was just wheeling and dealing, you know, from the crowd, trying to get it. Then, and then the thing is, you'll get behind somebody that's maybe older or somebody got some kids. And, you know, you, patience really got to take root. I mean, because you're looking like you, know, you can move quicker than that. You and your baby. You and your old self. You can move better than that and quicker than that. And so constantly there we was having to go in and out of the crowd and, you know, pass folks up and, you know, take a rest and, and kind of wonder, should we just return and go back? Because a crowd can be draining. It can be extremely tiring. <laughs> you thought that you wanted that sale, but once you get out there with all those folks, you want to, you know, is it really worth it? Saving 20 or $25, is it really, really worth it? I'll just wait and go home and just wait for it to go on sale. So I thought about the woman with the issue of blood, how she must have felt. Here she was hemorrhaging, not feeling good, had been bleeding for 12 long years in the midst of a crowd of people wondering and hoping that she'll be able to touch the man that had all her answers. The man that was right in front of her, but yet it was so many folks around him. How could she ever get to him? She knew that he had her answer, but yet it was a price to pay. And so we know she paid the price and she, she made her way through the crowd. She was assuming, unassuming. She did not ask for help. She made no demands. She had no desire to call attention to herself or her condition. She did not want anyone to know what she did. She just wanted help with her need. She would not have been healed without her determination, courage, attitude, motive, and faith. She refused to say, he probably can't help me either. I'll never make it through the crowd. If I am discovered, there is no telling what would happen to me. So she persisted until she got close enough to Jesus to touch him. And she touched him with her faith. And as a result, she was healed instantly. Now, the second thing you should notice in Jesus' reaction was Jesus was immediately aware of that somebody drew from his power. He knew that somebody had touched him. And so the Bible says that he even looked at his disciples and he said, who touched me? And the disciples looked at him to say, Jesus, now come on now. You got all these folks around here and you asking who touched you? Do you see how many folks is around you and you asking us who touched us? He said, somebody touched me. Because I felt virtue leave my body. Now, I'm sure that so many folks were there. I'm sure there was more people touching him beside that woman with the issue of blood. But it was something about that woman's touch that was completely out of the ordinary from anybody else's touch. She touched him with her faith. So when she touched him, I'm sure she was making a decree. I'm sure she was saying, oh, man of God, you got my answer. Oh, man of God, you got my deliverance. I done came all the way out of my house to touch you, and I'm not going back to my house the way I left it. So at that point, I'm sure she exerted some faith. She had actually probably made up her mind before she even got there. God... Enough is enough. <laughs> I done bled long enough. I'm not going back home like this. And the Bible says that Jesus knew that something had happened. And Jesus responded, must have amazed her. He said, your faith healed you. Your faith allowed this to happen. Go in peace. What confident words. He said, be cured. Now let's consider two, these two observations. Many people touched Jesus that day, as I said before. However, they did not expect anything to happen. Nothing happened. The woman touched Jesus for a reason with confidence. She wanted to be helped. She expected to be helped, and she was helped. 
The difference in the result was the difference in the people. The same difference is distinguished today. Some study the word and are changed. Some read the word and nothing happens. Some pray and are strengthened. Some pray and are not helped. Some worship and are closer to God. Some worship are boring and unmoving to God. But this woman had something. And when I begin to look at everything she did in her discouraging situation, she was desperate. She was in a complicated situation. However, how, how many ever been in a complicated situation? For example, you know, you got a car and somebody may be in the car and they say, oh, this is such a nice car and, you know, such a beautiful car and all this type of stuff. And, and they say, do you own a car? No, not really. The bank really owned the car. And, you know, I, you know, I'm believing God every month to make the payment. That's a kind of a complicated situation. Or, you know, I, or, you, know uh, you own a house and somebody say, isn't this a wonderful house? And you say, yeah, it's a wonderful house, but, you know, every month I got to make this payment on this house. It's a, it's a great house, but it's a complicated situation. However many people ever been in a complicated situation, or how many people have ever been living in the good of times and the worst of times at the same time. You know, on this side of the coin, everything is looking good, but yet on this side of the coin, it's like hell is breaking loose. It's good and it's bad at the same time. And you kind of like wonder, well, which way do I go? It's bad over here and it's good over there. And I'm just kind of like in the middle of it. <laughs> Have anybody ever felt like that beside me, that you was in the good of times of life and in the worst of times at the same time? And it's a complicated situation. So here she was. She was desperate. She was in a com contemplated situation, complicated situation. She was earnest. She had a hemorrhaging situation. She was willing to break social standards. She had a history of suffering. But she was willing to hope for Jesus. She heard of a savior. She knew there was hope for her situation. She had hope for her success. And she was satisfied and she was saved from her affliction. I'm sure if the song was around, she would sing a song like this at the end of the day. I was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. What looked like a tombstone became a stepping stone. What looked like a tombstone actually became her stepping stone. Have you ever been in a situation where it looks like you're on your way to your tomb? But God will always cause your tombstone to be like a stepping stone. The thing that you thought was going to take you out is the very thing that he creates to take you in. The very thing that you thought was going to devastate you and cause you to not be able to survive is the very thing that he's able to take. I always like to take, I always like to say he's always able to take the fragmented pieces, the broken pieces of your life and put them back together again. The potter knows how to put you back together again. Even though you was discarded and even though pieces are everywhere and you look at your life and say, oh my God. God, how will I ever put this back together again? How will I ever find this puzzle to fit with this piece? How will I ever be able to mend myself back together again? He is able to take a devastating situation that looks like a tombstone and cause it to be your stepping stone. The thing that you thought would walk on you He'll give you the ability to walk on it. 
the very thing that you thought, surely this going to take me out. Surely I will not survive this. God will take the very thing. Matter of fact, a whole lot of things don't even have to change. Only thing that really changes is your fight and your attitude and your determination to win. Because everything else looks the same. That's why you never wait until situations turn and change. You got the power to change them. And the power is within. Look at your neighbor and say, the power is within. So what looked like a tombstone became a stepping stone for her. So I got to choose to have tenacity over tolerance. I got to have tenacity over tolerance. And then I must realize that no matter what color my ball is in life, I still got the ball. No matter what color the ball is, your ball may be blue, your ball may be yellow, your ball may be red. No matter what color your ball is like. In matter of fact, matter of fact, no matter what you have, you know, whatever, you know, the, what, what is that called? The cards, the deck of cards that you've been issued. No matter what cards you've been issued in life, you can still win with the hand you've been dealt with. Even though you may not have had the best of opportunities, you still can win with the hand that you've been dealt with. And the wonderful thing about it, God never deals anybody a hand that they can't win with. Everybody is a winner. <laughs> no matter what hand you've been dealt with. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm still a winner. I still got the ball in my court. So promotion comes through the birth channel of struggle. Promotion comes through the birth channel of struggle. Promotion comes through the birth channel of struggle. And what struggle is, is my lunching pad. You know how a plane will have a lunching pad? Your struggle can be your lunching pad. It's able to lift you up from the ground and take you to a soaring position. Now, ego has the ability to soar. Matter of fact, eagles have sex even in the air. <laughs> they don't even go to the ground to have children. They even have sex in the air. You got to be make sure that you are sowing with every fiber of your being. You was made to soar. God didn't make you to live with the chickens. He calls you to soar with the eagles. So my struggle is my lunching pad. It is, going to, it is the very thing that's going to cause me to fly. That's why you never be so discouraged with things that you go through because I believe that every struggle that you go through in life is something that can be learned from that struggle. Struggle in itself is a teacher itself. You ain't got to go to school to learn how to pass a struggle. All you got to do is stay persistent, endure to the end, don't give up, don't quit. Don't be in under pressure. Don't fall apart. Don't faint. But stay in position. You will eventually get out of it. How many have ever, how many have ever, you know, you, and, and that's why many times I, I, I really catch myself if I get in a, in a place where I feel like, you know, I'm sensing that I'm getting ready to worry. How many have ever been in a place and you're just kind of worried about something and you know, and you just kind of stay there for a minute and all of a sudden, maybe the next week or, you know, maybe just a little bit longer. But, but you came completely out of it. And you look at it and you say, now, I don't spend all these hours worrying about this situation. I don't stayed up half the night wondering what I'm going to do where I could have been sleeping. 
And the enemy does that all the time. He is always trying to rob of us precious time. The thing that you should actually be releasing and letting go, he'll cause you to just kind of bombard your mind and, you know, you just feel like you just can't do anything. It'll kind of like paralyze you. Have anybody ever been in a situation where you just kind of felt like you were just paralyzed and that, you know, you tried to make a move, but you just couldn't quite do it. And if you did make a move, it seemed like it wasn't the right move and you were just paralyzed. You just felt like you was paralyzed. So promotion comes through the perfect channel of struggle. It is my lunching pad. Now this woman with the issue of blood, she coulda have become a coulda, woulda, and a shoulda. But it was something about her that caused her to be persistent in the face of a dying situation. It was something about her that gave her the fight to not give up. She persevered, even though it looked like nothing good was ever going to happen. And so today, I just want to encourage you. It's time for you to let go of discouragement. We have come to the end of the rope. We have been talking about discouragement for at least five or six weeks. But today, I want you to release yourself from discouragement. I don't know what you may be dealing with, what could be hindering you, but today is the day to be happy. Today is the day to look the trial dead center and say you will no longer dictate my outcome. Today is the day to look at that situation, whatever the issue was. The woman had an issue of blood, but there are many in here that got various issues that have caused you to be discouraged. Today, I want you to take a look at it. Matter of fact, let's just do it. I want you to mentally take a look at that situation or that issue, whatever it is. I want you to get your eye on it. I want you to see it. I want you to see it. Get a picture of it. I don't care how big it is or how small it is. I want you to get a picture of it. And I want you to look at it. Now it may look large, it may look small, no matter what it is, it's not bigger than you. Matter of fact, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes for just a moment. I want you to see yourself looking at that situation, that issue. And I want you to begin to see it crumble right in front of your face. Crumbling. Little by little, strand by strand, it's beginning to crumble right in your face piece by piece, every part of it, the situation within the situation, the circumstance within the circumstance. I want you to see it begin to just tumbling down. Can you see it with your eyes of faith? Now, it takes faith to do this. This ain't no mind over matter. We're talking about faith. Calling those things that be not as though they were. That's what we're doing. We're beginning to focus on causing the situation to come tumbling down. Now, as it began to crumble down, that situation, that circumstance, whatever it is, I want you to begin to see it just begin just to kind of vapor out. In other words, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Matter of fact, it's getting so small now that you can't even tell what it was. Now it's getting to the place where it is like non-existence. And it's almost like a vapor of smoke have taken it away. Now open your eyes. That's how you have to deal with everything 
that you have magnified in your life. Everything that has gotten to be so big and seemed to be so out of hand, you've got to imagine that it's gone. You got to see it gone. You got to see it dead. That's how you deal with discouragement. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so when I begin to visualize hope and an expected end, everything that is big, everything that is out of hand, everything that seemed to be out of control begins to come into control. <laughs> it begins to subside. And so that's what I need you to do. I need you to practice that on a daily basis. Take the giant that's in your mind. Take the giant and begin to see it come down. Now, I don't care if you get up from it and it looks to be bigger than what it already was. I don't care. Because what you're doing, you're practicing victory. You're practicing seeing victory. Because victory just don't ordinarily happen. You know, victory, you just don't wake up in the morning many times and just have victory. There has something that have taken place that caused victory to take place. And so what you do is you practice victory. You begin to see victory. Even though the bank account looks like, you know, it ain't nothing in it. I, you know, I'm getting ready to practice victory right now. Matter of fact, I'm going to praise God that money is in the bank. I'm practicing victory. You practice victory. You practice a glorious outcome. Well, did y'all get anything out of our little series on discouragement? <laughs> Dealing with discouragement, learning how to bounce back, learning that you are going to win in life no matter what. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I always win. I always bounce back. I'm up for the challenge. I'm up for the fight. I'm up for the fight. I'm equipped for the battle. I got my arm on. I'm equipped. And I'm ready to charge my giant. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Pastor Jerry's.